dedicated to geeks and nerds, you're listening to Project I Radio, 24-7, Nerdgasm. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f- Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by Project iRadio. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene. With me once again is Dave, Meteor Notes Thomas. How's it going? I hope everybody that was uh, stuck near me in traffic today enjoyed my epic in-car performance of Iron Maiden's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner while we were waiting. <laughs> is that what you did? Pretty much, okay. yeah. It's just Friday in Baltimore, so it means traffic. So. Right. Dave, we have someone else in the studio with us yes, today. Can you guess who? Uh, Don't guess. Don't guess. I want the audience to guess. He's the author of Shatner Quake, Cripple Wolf, and Supergiant Monster Time, among others. He's also the editor-in-chief of the magazine of Bizarro Fiction, and he's also my boss as head editor at Deadite Press. He's also a well-known and widely quoted political activist for issues such as anti-war, drug reform, LGBT rights, and feminism. I am, of course, talking about the inimitable Jeff Burke. Hello! It's so awesome to finally be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to have you here, buddy. That's great. I do want to mention that today's episode is brought to you by Dark Storm Creative. If you're an author or a publisher looking for affordable cover art, interior illustrations, website banners, or anything else, look no further than Dark Storm Creative. Check out their online online gallery or get a quote at darkstormcreative.com. Now, folks, I want to warn you in advance. Dave, social butterfly that he is. Yeah, I'm I'm very popular. He has to, he has to jet out of here early tonight to go see Spock's beard in concert. And also, uh, because Jeff is here visiting us from Portland, of course the entire Central Pennsylvania horror contingent is uh, about to swarm down upon my place. So we are going to forego the news. We're going to forego talking about anything. We're going to get right into it with Jeff. However, before we do that, I just realized I left the refrigerator on and the window open. So Dave, no, you need to fix that. You're going to stall while I go Absolutely fix those two not. things. If there's anything I'm good at, it's stalling. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm going to a musical festival this weekend called Rise Fest, which stands for Rise of Spring. It's the 12th year. It's a progressive band. I'm not going to be there all the time, but tonight, like you said, Spock Spears playing, and then Sunday night, Enchant is the headliner, and you're saying, who's Enchant? I've never heard of them. They who, are who's from, Enchant? I've never heard yeah, of them. Yeah, well, of course, uh, yes, of all people on earth, you would definitely be one not to hear of them, have a boy. Um, they're from Northern California. They've been around for over 10 years. They've got about eight or nine albums out. I don't remember. They just put a new one out this year. Um I definitely recommend checking them out if you've never heard of them. Defend me, Jeff. Now, you're a, yes. you're a punker. I am. And you're like an old school throwback punker. You're like punkers I remember in the 70s. Oh, thanks. But, you know, you're barely 30. So, yeah. defend me. ABBA is punk as fuck, right? I haven't listened to much ABBA ever. You're, they're, they're, yeah. I'm more, that makes them punk I'm more into punk. like the, the Clash, Crass, Doug Kennedy's, Leftover Crack. ABBA was right there with them. Man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here, Jeff, I'm just going to tell you right now tonight, while you're here, if you want to amuse yourself, peruse Brian's musical collection. That's all I'm going to say. Well, we're going to because I put together an epic five-hour party playlist. I'm a little worried about this. You it's, should uh, be. The Tramps, The Misfits, Guar, uh-huh. Ministry, Casey Lansdale. Okay, I approve of all Witch of this. Mountain, Yob. I don't, I don't know why you'd be worried. Okay, I approve yeah. of all of this. And then, and then it'll be ABBA and um, I don't know. There is no ABBA. No ABBA. There may be Andy Gibb, but there is no ABBA. <laughs> oh. All right, uh, folks, we're recording this on May 1st. It will air on May 7th. Um, and as I said, I'm making a command decision to forego all news reporting and get straight into it with Jeff because we've got a ton of questions for him. So, Jeff. Yes. 
You moved to Portland, Oregon in 2008? 2008, that was correct. And this is your first time back in central Pennsylvania since then? It's, oh, jeez. Yes, it's my first time back since then. I had to think about that. What's that like for you? It is really, really weird. It's been six years, and this place still feels like it's stuck in the mid-90s. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. very much so. It always does. (laughs) Also, I want to say it's really weird from Portland, Oregon, that we're about to legalize weed to be able to get sold to the general public, yet in PA here... it's so fucking difficult to get a beer. Yeah, you can't. Buy you beer you anyway. can't buy beer. Uh, weed is still illegal. Uh, it is legal, however, to fuck a goat. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> well, thank God. Yeah. Well, we have. <laughs> we have has that going for it, at least. <laughs> and of course, it's legal to shoot things and, and, and have tire fires and spit everywhere. Yeah. So now you mentioned legalization. Um, you are, of course, well, you know, well known as a political activist. Yes. Um, there are folks that know you for your activism that maybe don't even know you as a writer or an editor. Um, you were prominent in the Occupy movement. So yes. so now that you're here in central PA, Baltimore's 45 minutes down the road. Did you get a chance to go down this week? No, no. When the, uh, my plane landed in Baltimore, but uh, the airport is uh, beneath the city. And just for the sake of just being able to get up here to Pennsylvania, um, my ride, we went completely around the city. Yeah. Though I could not believe it, seeing it on the news. I was like, oh, good. I'm coming back to Baltimore right in time for a borderline race riot. <laughs> what timing? I didn't I didn't think it would turn into a, a full-blown race riot. I, I say that based on – I marched uh, during the – during the Ferguson riots, yeah. Baltimore, we did a you know a march in support of them, and, and I went down and I marched in that two nights in a row, and uh, I got to know a lot of the a lot of the activists down there. And in fact, uh, befriended some some members of the New Black Panther Party, sweet fucking guys. What, what and, I, very- uh, I you know I just I saw the media keep playing it. Oh, it's going to be a race riot. Yeah, and I I did not think that would happen, and of course that is not what happened. What I'm very pleased to see is it very much seems like the uh, violent activities have ended, but people have not stopped protesting. Exactly. And the communities have, I've been seeing on the news, the communities are all banding together and they're protecting themselves and they are still out on the streets demonstrating, which is good. They should not let this go away. Exactly. Civil disobedience, just don't burn shit down. Yeah. You know? All right. Well, so you were you were born here in PA. You yes, I was. You lived here most of your life. Yes. Uh, yet you edit extreme cult horror and you write bizarro fiction. So how the fuck did that happen? I mean, what did, what did you read growing up? Like, what were... Well, uh, growing up, uh, a lot of my big influences was kind of... Um, of course, I first got into Stephen King, Clive Barker, and H.P. Lovecraft is kind of like the standard for uh, everyone into our types of stuff. But uh, what really kind of blew my mind was when I first discovered uh, John Skip and Craig Spector. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, Michael Slade. Am I getting his name right? Yep. Yes. Uh, and uh, Jack Ketchum, of course. Um, your work and. Um, and Edward Lee and all them came a little bit later, right. which we'll probably get into. But those were really the formative, uh, the formative books I read growing up. So, how old were you, Skip and Spectre in particular? How old were you when you discovered them? Oh, I was in high school, so I was probably around like fifteen and when did, I first discovered them. Did you know at the time of their connection to Central PA that you know, I had zero idea? It wasn't until many years later when I finally got to meet Skip. And then I mentioned from York County, and he then started telling me stories about being oh, from yeah. York County. Um, I also had no idea how many horror people that I we currently work with at Eraser Press and Deadite actually have all these weird connections to Central Pennsylvania. I keep telling people, man, Central PA is like the Kevin Bacon of horror fiction. It and, really is. In addition to that, to tie back a little bit with the uh, – Talking about the old school punk, a lot of these great new anarchist punk bands that I currently listen to, a lot of them have their roots here in central Pennsylvania as well, which is just really bizarre. Uh, Mad Conductor, the Stupid Stupid Henchmen, they're all from this area, which is just weird to me. That's fucking sweet. Now, Dave, you're laughing. You don't believe that that York, Pennsylvania and Lancaster, Pennsylvania are the nexus of horror fiction? No, of course I know that because, you know, I, I... don't live here now. I used to live in Pennsylvania. Um, 
No, and it makes sense because this is a horrible, frightening place. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> it's terrifying. I mean, Absolutely. I, one thing I have to say, because you, know, you live in Portland now, um, yes. you, you have to be terrified about eating here <laughs> because the food here is awful. <laughs> well, I've been – one thing that I – there's two food items I really miss from this area. First off, Scrapple. I adore it. Wow. To anyone listening that doesn't know what Scrapple is, it's a big gray block of meat that's made of everything that didn't make it into the hot dog. Yeah, it's and not it's really goddamn meat. delicious. It's not really meat. It's so good. It's organs from the pig, but it, you can't qualify it as meat. Oh, that's good, though. Yeah, yeah, organs are good eating. Scrapple is good shit. Then I spent the past two days, in fact, I was eating it right before coming here, uh, Maryland Blue Crabs, well, which okay, you can't that, get it anywhere yes. else in the world, yeah. and they're just, yeah. they're my absolute favorite yeah. food. Right now, Ed Lee is listening, and he's cursing you because he can't get them down in Florida either. Him and I have gotten into arguments because he claims Dungeness Crabs are the cool. best crabs, and I completely disagree with him. We're, we're going to have him on in July, and we're going to yeah. put it to the test. Okay. No, no, no. He is a thousand percent wrong. On yeah, that one. exactly. Yeah, no, they don't even come close to the Maryland no. crab. I, we were traveling one time, me and my ex-wife, and we were in uh, South Carolina, and we're in a restaurant, and the, uh, the the waiter's like, "Oh, I have the specials," and he's like, "Oh, I have a crab cake today," and he's like, "We're like, well, how's it?" How's it prepared? And he says, where are you guys from? And she says, Baltimore. He goes, oh, you won't like them. Because it's like, unless they're made in Maryland with a Maryland crab. it's No, you can't yeah. eat crab cakes yeah. anywhere else. No. They're just terrible. No, exactly. All right. So you grow up reading Skip Inspector and Ketchum and Michael Slade. Um, and a little later, you discovered me and Ed Lee. Uh, I, a quick aside, I got to tell you about and, and Skip. Skip has heard this story. Uh, him and Craig Spector both, they, they do remember this. Before I turned 21, they used to play at this this club in York City, you know, downtown York. Uh, their band would play in there. And I couldn't get in because I wasn't 21. I didn't have a fake ID. But a couple, couple nights, Friday nights, I went down there with my manuscript for the first novel I'd ever written. It was complete and utter shit. But I was convinced if I could get in to meet Skip and Spectre, they could help me get published. <laughs> And they never did, but they Skip did remember me. He's like, oh, you were that kid. You were the kid with the mullet. And I'm like, yes, I was the kid with the mullet. And yeah. is that a little bit like what our story is? Well, no, that's, that's... that's where I was going. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk about the first time we met. Now, let me set the stage. Um, I had four books out, The Rising, City of the Dead, Terminal, and The Conquer Worms. And I was actually on tour for The Conquer Worms. And I'm speaking at this library in western Pennsylvania. I don't remember the town. Indiana, Pennsylvania. Indiana? Okay. That was where I went to college. All I was right. 21 at the time. All right. And, it, I mean, it's a big crowd, but it's all like, you know, f- middle-aged folks and senior citizens and, and not anyone that was familiar with my work. And there's this, you know, this weird punk rock kid in the back. I thought maybe you were in high school. I guess you were in college at the time. I had just turned 21. Yep. But the only thing I noticed about you at the time was look at that dude representing. I like to see that punk is, is still popular. And damn, I can smell the weed coming up. <laughs> Here. I wonder if I can smoke one with him after this. So, you know, I do my little talk and then it comes time for Q&A. And, you know, it's it's all the standard questions like, you know, how do you write a book? And I, I bet you make money like Stephen King. And, and you know, I'm about yeah. to cut my fucking wrists. And then the punker in the back, he raises his hand. No, that's not completely true. No, because, that's how I remember. Well, I was stoned off my ass and you actually just shit pointed at me. And you're like, I want some people to ask questions. You there. I think you have a question. Okay. And I just remember just being like, oh, my God, I have to talk to Brian Keene and I'm so high right now. So, and I even remember the question I asked. Well, I, hold on. <laughs> but you were high, so do you think you're a reliable witness? I remember you raising your hand. And touché, then I followed, touché. You, you may have an but, interesting. But, you have an interesting point there. Yeah, your question was about Lovecraft's influence on the Conqueror Worms. Yes. and it blew me the fuck. I mean, I was still, I wasn't a newbie, but I, I was still, you know, kind of making a name for myself. And here's somebody that's not only read the fucking book I'm talking about, but has this great question that. Not even the critics have really picked up on, despite the fact that the entire second act involves Cthulhu. So, yeah, I remember that, and I, I remember leaving afterward and thinking, that that kid was all right. And, in fact, I came home, I, I told my wife, ex-wife now, I, I told her, yeah, it was all right, but there, there was a really awesome kid there. He was a good guy. 
Fast forward like a decade and a half later, and now you're my boss. Yeah, that still kind of blows my mind how that how that whole thing worked out. And did I even tell you actually how I even found your books in the first place? You never did. Oh, this is a great uh, bizarre story. It was um, I uh, had been early in college and I had come back to visit my uh, parents in Southern York County, and it just so happened to coincide with Horror Find in Maryland. Right. So I went down the Horror Find and. That weekend, uh, the, the story's going to bounce around a little bit here, but it all comes back to uh, back to how I found your books. Okay. First off, there was some flyers for something called the Brutally Evil Satan Show starring Carl Tamell the Third all over the place. And I had never heard of this guy, and I didn't even know what this was. So I went to see this weird event of this – Big guy with these big mutton chops ranting about Satan and exploding uh, pentagrams and brain (laughs) cannons. And then it turns out this weirdo also wrote books. So I basically went up to uh, his book table afterwards, which was run by Rose O'Keefe, who I didn't know at the time, and basically just threw money at them and (laughs) came out with a stack of his books. In the main dealer's room was also Necro Press, who I never heard of, with some guy that had a bunch of books, Edward Lee. Yep. And there was the pig in the house. And I'll never forget, like, opening up the pig in the house, and the first line, I'm going to get this a little bit wrong, but it's pretty close of, like, she took the shot of pig semen with ease. And then after reading that, I was like, oh, I need to get this book. <laughs> now... I was driving back to uh, driving back from the convention, and I had traveled, went to the con with a friend, and he wanted to stop at uh, Borders, and we stopped there, and there was a big display of some local author by the name of Brian Keene, yeah. and they had the just released, uh, I almost said Earthworm Gods, but Conqueror Worms at the time in paperback from Leisure, and it had that uh, cover that you talked about on a previous episode of your show right. of the really stupid gummy worm erupting <laughs> from the ground. And I gotta be honest, I saw that cover and my first thought was, that is the stupidest book cover I have ever seen in my life. I have to buy that book. You know what, my and reaction, the book was my reaction amazing. was the same thing. My reaction was the same thing. That's the stupidest book cover I've ever seen in my but life. But it sold me on the book. Right. So that same that weekend, same weekend I discovered Carl Tamont III, Edward Lee and Brian Keene. And honest to God, I'm not exactly sure what year this would have been, but I would have been like... That would have been 2005. That sounds about right. And I found out about all three of you that weekend, and I had absolutely no idea that actually just a short three years later... That I would start uh, professional. Well, it was three years later I started working with the Eraserhead Press, and then about what uh, a year or two, uh, about two or three years after. When that. When did Dorchester go down? 2010. Uh, that sounds about so, right. Yeah. So about two, three years later. And we'll get to that. Um, started then working with Edward Lee and Brian Keene, but that weekend, just looking back on it, still just blows my mind. I had no idea how much of my future life was determined just through buying random books from cool from cool people that interest me the only thing i remember about that weekend that particular weekend two things number one was uh dave barnett of necro press <laughs> some some dimwit walked by and thought he was warwick davis the actor. <laughs> and the first dave got pissed you know i think he said something like what all of us little people look the same and, you know but i said to him i said no dude Fuck it. Pretend you're Warwick Davis. Yeah. So he did. Oh, we can, and he sold Gangba. Hey, Warwick Davis is publishing books now. That's <laughs> the, amazing. The other thing I remember is is getting stuck in an elevator with Rain Graves, Barry Huffman of Gauntlet Press, Mary San Giovanni and her, her boyfriend at the time, um, Linda Addison, John Urban Sick, and, and some other folks. And we had one working cell phone, Barry Huffman's cell phone. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to call his attorney rather than emergency services to get us the book out. What did he think an attorney was going to do? Well, he, he wanted to get his lawsuit all oh, over okay, before okay. they were... But uh, that was the only... I don't remember meeting you there, but I definitely remember meeting no, you No, we... Act, um, 
we did not speak to each other then. The first time I met you was at that uh, at book that signing in Indiana, Pennsylvania, okay. which totally blew my mind when I was in school. And there was actually posters up in the uh, student union right. over you uh, coming to town, even though I'm pretty certain I was the only person from the actual college who showed up to that. I think you were. To that reading. It was all like like – Old conservative looking yeah. women that yeah. were all there for you. And they were they were quite flustered. But I flirted, <laughs> I flirted with them. They warmed yeah. up. So you basically you followed sort of I don't wanna make it sound like a, you're a bizarro deadhead, but you, you sort of oh, followed Carlton and Rose out to Portland. Oh right? and, indeed I did. Yeah. Um I uh if anyone's not aware of small town Pennsylvania it is just total dead end. There is nothing to do here. It just really feels like there's no opportunity, nowhere to go. And I knew some friends that were moving to Portland, Oregon, and they uh, offered like, hey, Jeff, if you want to get out of Pennsylvania, join us. And I knew that Eraser Press was based out of Portland. And, and by that point, I had got fully into the uh, small press horror scene and got like super into uh, bizarre fiction. And in my mind, it was uh, Troma in New York City and Eraserhead in Portland were the only two independent companies uh, I was aware of that I thought was doing really anything interesting. Right. And Portland was a lot cheaper than New York City. So I'm like, fuck it. Maybe I can show up to Portland, Oregon and get a job with Eraserhead Press. And that's what you did? That's exactly what happened. It just so coincidentally turned out that Eraserhead was ready to hire its first employee at the time that I showed up wow. and they knew me as a super fan and I had reached out to him in events like, Hey, I'm going to be in the Portland area. It'd be awesome to meet you guys. And they didn't know I was gunning for a job with them, but on their end, they were thinking, maybe we can talk this Jeff Burke guy into working for wow. us. So we wow. were both courting each other without the other ones knowing that we were being courted. That's fucking awesome. You need another beer? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah. I'll get you one. I'm going to pour myself uh, some Knob Creek rye. Dave, would you like another water? Uh, no, I'm good right now. All right. And I'm just excited to see Knob Creek instead of that sewage that you had the other week. Well, the, I have the sewage out over there in case uh, one of our guests tonight wants yeah. to drink it. Uh, <laughs> while we're plugging Knob Creek, this would be a good time to mention that today's episode is brought to you by Dark Storm Creative. Uh, if you are an author or a publisher looking for cover art, interior illustrations, website banners, etc., Look them up online at darkstormcreative.com. All right, Dave, I'm going to I'm gonna grab Jeff a beer. Okay. And he's going to – now, this could be scary. He has, some, he has some terrifying beer in there. Did you like the Goat Rodeo? The Goat Rodeo was great. That was right. an awesome name. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I've never had that, but I love the name. I, it was pretty good. Uh, yeah. Saranac Goat Rodeo. Another there shameless go, plug. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I can't so, none of these alcohol companies will send us like free alcohol. Right? Oh, they will. That's what they will. <laughs> I mean, as long we're, as it's not we're, in, we're an iTunes top 100, man. I mean, are we seriously? Yeah, we should. Holy shit! Like know, I, I know nothing about. I fully this expect show. you know to yeah. at least have stamps dot fucking com as a sponsor yeah. soon. But I, like I said, I I I don't see the statistics or anything. I. I see people online commenting on Brian. Um, so far, the only comment I've seen about me is I'm the most annoying person ever. So, folks, <laughs> folks this week, tweet at Meteor Notes on Twitter and, and tweet him things, uh, boob pictures especially, or dick pics. You know, no, and, I yeah, <laughs> I have one. I don't need pictures. I, All right. <laughs> so, you, you when last we tuned in, Jeff Burke had moved <laughs> to Portland, Oregon, and had gotten a job as the first employee of a Razorhead Press. So. Eventually, you became the uh, first, the, first the editor of the magazine Bizarre Fiction. Yes, that's now correct. was that something you pitched to them, or did they bring it to you? Oh, um, I pitched it to them, and I will just say to anybody listening that if you're interested in getting involved on the like production end of literature and that a magazine is one of the worst fucking places in the world to start. Absolutely. Uh, that has yeah. still been yeah. the most <laughs> difficult project I have ever been Absolutely. involved in. Uh, it, it's 
went well for a little bit, but god damn, it's a hard yeah. uh, just first of all organizing all the authors, you know, just getting all the content, and then having to get um, people to buy ads just so yeah. you can fund the damn thing. It's it was very difficult. You might be too young to remember the horror show magazine, but I'm sure you've heard of it. I've heard of it, but that was, yeah. was a little bit before my uh, got involved. Before they both unfortunately passed away, uh, J.F. Gonzalez and I had talked to David Silva about buying the rights to the name and bringing the magazine back. Um, and ultimately, we didn't. Not because it wasn't an affordable offer. Dave actually had a great offer for us, but just because when we crunched the numbers, the amount of work involved and the, the very slim profit margin, if any profit margin at all. It just we could oh, make it tenable. I'm still not even sure if I ever broke even on any issue of the magazine of bizarre fiction. Is it still is it still being published? Uh, we actually have um ooh here we have you have an exclusive from me here. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Um, <laughs> We've only got to do that once in the show so yeah. far. So. <laughs> uh, we, we obviously have been having a hard time uh, keeping up the magazine of Bizarre Fiction just with all the difficulties in running the magazine, especially in this current uh, financial climate and the way that people consume fiction now. The magazines as a whole are just kind of dying. So what we're shifting to, and this will be in in effect by the end of this year, that the magazine of Bizarro Fiction will become a paid online magazine. Ooh. So people, it will be free for readers, but for people writing for it, it will, um, we're still figuring out what the rates will be, right. but we'll make sure that it's worth people's while. And when you say online, will that be Kindle and Nook as well, or just like a website? In all honesty, we're still in the position of figuring all that out. Okay. All right. All right. And then eventually, of course, um, Eraserhead decides to expand, and they do Deadite Press. Yes. And, you know, you're the, the head honcho of Deadite. Now, you have published, you know, Dave Brocky of Guar. Yes. Edward Lee, myself, Rath James White, Monica O'Rourke, J.F. Gonzalez, Brian Smith, many, many, many more. Um, I did say earlier we would we would talk about how I ended up with you. Um, I it was after the Dorchester Wars and and everything was done and the smoke had cleared and you know everybody was starting to find publishers, and I found myself in the position, the enviable position of being courted by every single fucking publisher you can think of. Every mass market publisher, every small press, everybody's making me an offer. You know, St. Martin's, Penguin, this person, that person. And I listen to all the offers, and then uh, Rose reaches out to me, and she says, hey, come out here to Portland. You know, we'll fly you out. Um, we know you're considering some other offers, but, but here our pitch. And I'm like, all right, because I've known Carlton and Rose God, since like 99. Yeah, you guys go yeah, way yeah. back. I mean, you know, we're dear, dear friends. And, um, and it would have been great to see them anyway. Plus, it's a free trip to fucking Portland. Okay, yeah. So I come out, and there's you. There's the kid from the library. <laughs> and it's, and it's, this is Jeff. Now, the the one thing I will remember, I, I was very cautious about you at first. And I'll admit this to you. I'll tell you why. Even though we're politically different, I'm a, a left-leaning libertarian. I'd say you're a... An anarchist. I identify yeah. as an anarchist. Yeah, um, you know, but we we 100% agree on LGBT rights. We agree on legalization. We agree on anti-war feminism. But the one thing we are completely at odds going to come up. <laughs> yeah, we're you you are for the liberalization of copyright laws. Yes, I am not. Um, and so I was a little nervous about you at first. <laughs> you know, um, but. You won me over, and then I will, I'll never forget this. You, the three of you took me out to dinner, and, you know, I i don't know if Rose minds me talking about this on the air. Yeah, I think it'll be fine. Basically, you you guys handed me your financials. And, oh, yes, that's right, yeah, did. The, the yep. books, the, yep. the accounting ledgers, and, and Rose just said, everybody else is giving you their pitch. Here's ours. Here's where the company is at. And they left the bar and left me sit there reading the ledgers. And I'm reading it, and my first thought was, holy fuck, I could blackmail the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm reading it, and uh, I guess you guys gave me about 20 minutes, and they came back in, and, and uh, Rose says, what do you think? And I said, when do I sign? And, and that was it. 
I was on board. Um, yeah, I, that blew my mind yeah. at the time. I couldn't believe that. I was so thrilled. You know, and, and since then, I, I'm still not quite as liberal as you on copyright law, but you, you have made me see file sharing does serve a purpose. However, I am of an age, and I've been fucked so many times in this business that I still can't see file sharing and think of it as anything other than, that's that's a dollar I could have had in my pocket. See, but that's the capitalist in me. I, I disagree with that assessment, because that's how a lot of people want to look at it, is that for every download, it's a dollar lost. But the people that are most into downloading, first off, and there's many sites that prove this, the people that download, download the most material are also the same people that spend the most money on physical material. And a lot of people that do the illegal downloading are doing it to try out and experiment with different, be it filmmakers, authors, musicians. Well, what are they experimenting with? Just trying it out rather than having to put forward the money and pay money for something and get burned on it because we've all had the experience of spending money and then be like, oh man, this fucking sucks. I wish I had my 10 bucks back. But rather uh, start, try it for free and then be like, wow, this is really fucking cool. I'm going to spend $100 on this person because I, I want their shit and I want to support them. I see overwhelmingly the people that are most into the illegal downloading are actually the people that care the most about the arts and entertainment. Are you sure? That's honestly what I believe. Even and the comic, I, even the comic book people. Um, even the comic book people. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the, these people getting the scans of the comic books. Are are they really going out and buying that floppy that week? You know what? Uh, for myself, that's how I first started getting into like um, uh, Warren Ellis and Grant Morrison. Was I first uh, downloaded? Uh, their f files from a torrent site blew my mind and now I have like the super expensive hardbacks of them all that I buy as they come out yeah. and that's my personal experience and I know lots of other people who I don't want to, I'm okay with going on the record and saying my name that I'm, I am pro uh, legal downloading and that I do it. I don't want to out other people because right. they might not like that, but I will say I know oh, of there's a other, lot of people, other people that do the exact same, my, exact same my thing. My co-writer, Nick Mamatas, you know, he, he feels, uh, as, as you do very strongly about it. And, you know, I told him the same thing I told you when, when I signed with that, I, I said, here, here's my rule, Jeff. You're not okay. allowed. You're not allowed to put my shit up on Pirate and, Bay. And I have helped with that. I have uh, never yeah. done that. Though I do want to point out, if you notice, other people have done. Oh, it. I know they. If have. you search for it, I um, like I may not have put that up there, but other people put it up. And why do people put it up? Is because they're fans. The but, people put okay, up the but, stuff okay, aren't trying to rip okay, you but off. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I had the the sequel to, to Earthworm Guts uh, Earthworm Guts uh, to Deluge. Deluge, yeah. I was doing it as a free serial on my website and giving it away for free, a chapter a week. The only thing I want in return is people to come visit my fucking website. Yeah. Before I'd even finished the goddamn book, people were already compiling it and putting it up on Pirate Bay. <laughs> What welcome, are they getting out of that? Welcome to the internet. It's all about being first. Oh, no. What, yeah. what they get out of it is these are the people putting up the stuff are the super fans. They're not putting it up to rip off people. They're putting it up because they want to share with the online community. You need to find out about this awesome person. Okay, and I get that because the, the guy that put it up, to his credit, he fessed up to me. And he explained his reasons, and it, it, that's what it was. It was a super fan kind of thing. But from my perspective... First of all, that thing is unedited. It's it's raw first draft material that's been thrown up on a website. It's not even finished. You know, the book is, there's not even a conclusion to the book yet. Number two, technically, that counts as a first printing. So, now, I, I don't know of a publisher in the world that would, would actually hold to that, but... It, that, that, I will give you that. That's a really interesting yeah, um, you know, point. To, so, I, while... While I get his intent, and while I understand and recognize and respect his intentions, it still feels like somebody walked into my house, logged onto my computer while I was sleeping, and said, ooh, here's something new he's working on. I'm going to put that up on the internet. Now, one point that I want to bring up, and I would like to, I would love to hear your response to this, um, 
Now, in order for that stuff to be put up, somebody has to. Now, now, now let's, let's ignore um, Earthworm Gods too, since that was a free thing right. on your website for a moment. Right. But for, like, say, um, other books, how they had to get those files, they had to pay for them first. And so someone had to originally pay money for it, and that's a super fan who then put it up for free. But here's a um, hypothetical thought game. What if the concept of libraries had never existed and somebody came up with the concept of libraries now? Do you think people would react to the brand new concept of libraries in the same way they react to illegal dowling? Because in my mind, I view that if we get rid of, like if it's a real hard crackdown on internet downloading, that's basically the second sacking of the Library of Alexandria. Because at no point in human history has so much art, entertainment, information and knowledge been available to so many people at such ease of access. Dave, I don't know about you, but I got to admit, he just can, he just won me over with that I'm, argument. I'm pretty much on his side about this anyway. I've just been letting you two guys debate because <laughs> it would be two against one like usually is here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, is that today's installment of Dave is right about this? <laughs> uh, no, we're not going to do that today. That, that'll, that'll be later on. Um, no, I, it, like he just said, you know, there's, it's interesting. He brings that up as an interesting point. We're not really archiving a lot of this stuff, and it's sad because there's already tons of things. Think about the the, the web and, and web pages. They're not really archived, and you know the web's been around for like 20 years now. We've lost so much stuff already. Yes. Birdisevil.com. You can't find it anymore. Anybody here remember Bert is Evil? I don't remember that. At it all. was pictures of Bert from Sesame Street, photoshopped him oh, like riding in a car with Hitler and. <laughs> I don't with remember Marilyn Monroe during her autopsy yeah. photo. It was one of like the first really viral websites. Yeah. I mean, this is back in the days of GeoCities and right. the AOL discs that yeah. came in the mail, but you can't find it anymore. But it, it's 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 cool that all this stuff is online, but we really need to think of a way to really be archiving this stuff so that 20 years from now, if somebody wanted to see bird is evil.com, like their dad tells them about it or something, right. there should be a way to see that. You know what I mean? Like we really need to start thinking about this and make sure that stuff is in a format that can be read 20 years from now. Cause that's another thing too, is like formats disappear. Like I have a, a the other day I'm cleaning out my office. I come across a zip cartridge. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah, I, remember you know, I don't have a reader for it. I have no idea what's on this thing. I'm sure it's nothing useful because it's to me, but still like, you need to kind of start thinking about this stuff. Like, you know, your, your, your documents, are they backed up in a way that you can easily read them, you know, 10 years from now or five years from now, right. you know, you know, I, I assume you probably use Microsoft word like most people. Yeah. But, well, you yeah. have to in this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, eventually Microsoft word might go away, you know, and going yeah. back to, um, being from small town, Pennsylvania, yeah. I remember growing up here and we had no internet access in my house. We had no cable TV. We lived out in the woods and they refused to run any sort of cords out to us. And I would have to like borrow my mom's car, drive an hour to get to the nearest like Suncoast video, of course that would cost gas, pay $30 to buy a DVD because it was my only opportunity to even try and check out um, with people who like Stuart Gordon or, Stuart Gordon or uh, Fulci or Argento and that was how I got all into them. I look back and I spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars just to see a movie because especially in these small towns you're so cut off from the rest of the world you feel right and i didn't know anybody that was into punk or horror or like weird alternative counterculture stuff around around here so um like i can't imagine how different my how, how different my life would have been and like how much more I would have been able to pursue yeah. and get into if I would have had the opportunity. And now someone may be like, oh, you could have gone to your local library. My local library was goddamn fucking shit. Like there was no high in the I have holes been, there. I have been to your local yeah. library where you grew up. And, yeah. And I will agree. Uh, they may was, have had two King novels and a Kuntz, and that was it. That Maybe was a horror section. They, they had no Clive Barker. Yeah, they had yeah. no H.P. Lovecraft. No, you're absolutely right, because, like, now, again, I am old, um, so I, I I went to school pre-internet. But I think about what you're talking about, and, you know, you were, you're into punk. I was into metal. 
yeah. which I still am, um, growing up, and I knew nobody else that was into it. Nobody that I went to school was like the music that I like. It would have been so cool to have had the internet back then and be able to meet people like I do now, you know, that you know from all over the world that like the same kind of music and you talk about it and you hear about bands you ever heard of. You're like, I'll hear a band from like Tunisia, you know. I, when I was in high school, there's no way you would have ever known this music even existed, you know. So the internet and the file trading, like I agree with you. I, all right, I, and I have to admit, thing. and I, and this is not bullshit for the air. I've never heard you make the library argument. Um, that works for me. You see where I live. I still yeah. worry about the money coming out of my pocket, but that works for me. And I do also just want to clarify, this is also like not an abstract for me. Like I make my living. All of my bills, all my rent, all of my food, all of my cat's food is paid for 100% by the uh, work I do with Eraserhead and Dead Eye Press. So it's not like I have another source of income coming in anywhere. Um, I, though... For one, I also uh, I, I put all of my to anyone listening. You can find all of my books that I have, that I have written up on torrent sites, and I encourage you to download them and check them out if you want. All right, uh, uh, breaking I, news. Yeah, well, breaking. Oh, go ahead, Dave. I encourage you to buy Shatterquick and read. Uh, it. All right, so that that I love. And it. we're we're going to get into your books here okay. in, just, in just a few minutes. But yeah. uh, this is this is a first. Brian admits he was wrong about something. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> and, uh, and I may need more heart but, surgery. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, what's going on now? Oh, wait, we're going to have a picture taken. Uh, we're going to capture this moment. <laughs> I was wrong, Jeff. I'm posing for the folks at home. Get it? <laughs> um, I, I, of course, am facing away from the camera. And, my and Rose, because I know you're going to be listening to this, Jeff has my permission to upload my deadite titles to to the to the file sharing sites if they're not up there already i'm sure they all are well um one thing neat thing we like doing is we like working with a lot of our authors and trying to encourage them to put stuff up for the downloading but a neat thing we've done and um a neat thing we've done we've had some authors write introductions to the people downloading the books for free so some books have special introductions in them I'm, that have i'm two direct. years i'm two years behind deadline on turning in suburban gothic <laughs> i don't have time to write new introductions but but where i was going with that is um we have these introductions and we don't actually like in we if they, we encourage people if they like these books to Write reviews on for Amazon.com. If you liked it, tell your friends about them the next time you're, you know, drinking or getting stoned or that. It's a word of mouth. We're a DIY company, so our main enemy is obscurity. That's what we really have to fight against. It's just getting the word out about us actually means is like our top priority and means the most and translates into us being the most stable. Hold that thought because yes. the question I have for you, three questions from okay. now, comes back into that. Okay. Um, Dave, how are you for time? It's it's five just, after six. It's fine. We are right. to 41 minute mark. All right. Um, I want to touch very briefly on Deadites covers. Now, oh, okay. Now, here here is a case where I agree with you 100 fucking percent. Um, you know, are those covers for everybody? No. Are they going to get a stock at Barnes and Noble? No. However, the people complaining about them, and I'm looking at you folks on the hard drive, man. <laughs> I'm happy you said it and not me. Yeah, no, fuck it. It's the hard show of Brian Keene. <laughs> <laughs> they know what the fuck they're listening to. Here's the thing. We all a bunch of middle-aged white guys who want horror the way we we remember horror. But I got news for you guys. That's that's not who's buying horror these days. Um, I have met Deadites customers. I have met the people purchasing my Deadite horror titles. And Jesus Gonzalez, were he alive, would tell you the same fucking thing. We we've met them at signings. I've met young people, all under the age of thirty who owned every single one of my leisure editions and went out and repurchased the dead eyed editions just so they could get those covers. Those covers may not appeal to you, but those covers are not designed to appeal to you. Um, they are designed to appeal to a very particular demographic. Anything you want to add to that, Jeff, oh, yes. or did I, did uh, I just say it all? No, no. I, um, well, I mean, that, that very succinctly sums it up. But our, what we're thinking when we come up with these outlandish covers that some people find offensive, some people find gross, 
if quite frankly, you're not our fucking audience. Who we're, who we're thinking of is, you called it, people under 30. And we're thinking young punks, young metalheads, um, young stoners, young partiers, people that um trying to keep horror alive. Horror is not going to be kept alive, or just horror and bizarro. Um, all of our niche genre interests are not going to be kept alive through $50 hardbacks. You're not going to fucking agree. convince someone that's 20 years old to spend $50 on a mail order hardback. I agree. It's, it's, it's the same culture war, age war that's going on in comic books right now. You know, there, yes. there are people, me and Dave's age, who are pissed off that, you know, Thor is now a woman, and uh, Captain I'm, America is black. Not you and I, per se. Uh, I, but, want, I want to go on record yeah. very clearly that Thor being a woman does not piss me no, off. No, it doesn't yeah. bother me. No, doesn't and, bother and, me. and what these people don't understand, they're not writing comic books for us anymore. Exactly. Because, quite frankly, we're not fucking buying comic books anymore. Not, trying, certainly not the mainstream comics, yeah. no. You know, I yeah. I, yeah, I still read Marvel. You know what You know what Marvel I read? It's, it's the stuff that from the 70s that I read as a kid that I have a nostalgia for. Yeah, I don't... The, the yeah. comics I'm buying these yeah. days are Image and Dark Horse and Antarctic Press. Exactly. I don't, Oni, I don't read any superhero you know. stuff. It's all um, weird stuff. But it's... We see the same thing in horror now. They're... And I, hard driving folks, I'm I'm really not picking on you, but yes, you are. This is this is where I've seen the conversation take place the most. It, it's it's a bunch of, of folks our age who want their genre to stay the same, and they 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 don't understand that you know you you have to grow the industry. Things there has to be change. yeah, there have to be new readers yeah. coming in. I, I, I must be in the minority, you know, despite being ancient that. I don't want things to stay the same. That's boring. I like that things change. I mean, okay, maybe I don't like how it changes, but whatever. It's, I'd like it's, my love life to stay the same. Uh, other than that. Yeah, I, we're, that is so not a topic for this show. You would not <laughs> believe how many little old women I've sold copies of the Baby Jesus Buck plug to. I guarantee it. Events. I guarantee it. No, I, I totally believe it. But, yeah, we do a lot of um, – I, I do a lot of conventions – and fan events um, all over the country and sell books at them. And I cannot count the number of young people. And I say young people, I mean like people that are very obviously like 15, 16, that are even like questionable if they should be like purchasing some of this stuff or younger than that. And they see this and it's just like, where has this been all my life? I never see books like it. A lot of people that buy Deadite and Eraserhead press books don't buy books from any other companies. And we know this. They tell us this. And it's not because they don't want to read. It's because they don't see anything else happening that looks appealing yep. to them. Mm -hmm. That if you just throw like a creep, a, just throwing a creepy house on the cover and calling it the house. And I don't mean <laughs> to insult any of the dozens of people who have written a book called The House. We're looking at that, you, Bentley Little. But that doesn't, <laughs> but that doesn't, that doesn't fucking cut it anymore. At least in terms of new, gaining newer people. That there's so much information out there that also going back at no point in human history has so much art and entertainment been so readily available and you have to make a name for yourself you have to give people a reason to pay attention to you and even with the people complaining about us they're still fucking paying attention to us no, exactly. they can't ignore yeah. us exactly i like i know if i was like in my 20s right now and i walked in somewhere and i saw those covers i would buy every one of those books without even looking at the back cover just because those covers and, speak to that part of my brain. And those covers are what I want because yeah. I remember like when I first started get, like, getting like, Edward Lee, uh, Brian King books, um, Jeff Gonzalez, um, Rath James White. I couldn't convince my friends to read them. All my friends were avid readers, but they didn't want to read the books. They just be like, eh, that, that's, that's, that's boring. Well, like, why got, should I read it? It's got but, hands on the cover. Hands on the but, cover yeah. but, I'll, but I could get them to watch Dead Alive with me. I could get them to, to watch you know any Hellraiser movie. I could get them to watch Cannibal Holocaust, and they love it, but I couldn't get them to pick up the liter literary equivalent because right. it just didn't – it just looks so subdued, and you just got to fight for attention now. Like right. it's – I agree. Well, that brings me back to, to this question, and this is one I, I wanted to ask, and we've, we've danced around it a couple mm -hmm. of times. Now, as I said, I've known Carlton and Rose mm -hmm. since they were starting out, since I was starting out, and I've known you – since even before you were starting yeah. out. Um, you know, Eraserhead and Deadite 
they were always supposed to just be this cult thing, you know, the small cult audience, the trauma of literature. And we've had Lloyd Kaufman describe us as the trauma yeah. of literature. But I think it's fair to say we're not we're not this small cult thing anymore. It's weird. Yeah, uh, you know, Bizarro is is going mainstream. Uh, you know, I am certainly not a cult author anymore. Uh, you know, nor is Brian Smith or, or Lee, you know, some of the others from your stable. Does that does that trouble you? Does it bother you that oh, that fuck no. that it's going that it's going mainstream? No, we want it to be mainstream. We want it to be huge. Um, we want our what we're putting out to have an influence on the greater entertainment world and inspire people. Because I mean, at the very least, it's going to mean there's going to be more people producing stuff that we that we want to see that we like. The reason we're doing this. Um, if we just wanted to have it be a small niche audience, we would have gone to $50 hardback route. Right. But we don't do that. We don't do that at all. Um, all of our authors retain their hardback rights so they can go to somebody else and do that. We're focused on reaching the masses, and we want to reach the masses. We want to reach the weirdo, punk, metal, hippie, counterculture kid in the little small town that feels like that there's um, – like there's nobody else out th- out there like them and inspire them that like, no, you too can create art. You too can create something and do it. That there's whole communities of, of creators and fans and support out and there. And that is why I love you. And that is why I love Eraserhead Press. And that's why I love the whole Bizarro movement. That right there in a fucking like, nutshell. Some people view like keeping underground as keeping pure. And I view that as like pretentious. And it's, it's like, I'd rather take over the world. Have, having been involved in music for most of my life, I've heard this argument so many times about like, it was cooler when it was underground. And it's like, it's cooler to also have money, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and to be popular and have people like. What's the point? I've always said, what's the point of recording an album? No one's going to listen to, you know, like ten people because it's underground. That, that's stupid. You yep. want people to hear or read or or experience your art. And you most know. of us do this. Most of us involved in all be it Eraserhead, Deadite, Lazy Fascist, Fungasm, all do it full time. And you know, poverty fucking sucks. It does. We yes. want we <laughs> want people to. To like us, yeah, yeah and be able to us, pay and your bills and eat and pay your bills, have a good eat, time, and yeah, and have fun, yeah. and also reach people and hopefully inspire them as well. Yeah, to, that's very weird that now also we're getting young authors come up, and we see us a lot of doing Bizarro Con, young authors who've been like following the company since they were in some cases like. 13 and it was the first time they ever started getting in books and now they're like 18 and they want to start trying their hand at writing and that they saw that like oh look there's these weirdos that can do it you don't have to be you don't have to be all stuffy and you don't have to dress all conservative and you don't have to like spend years in grad school to write a book you can right. just run into your passions and you know take them by the throat do what you love. We try to bring the punk rock metal ethos to books. Yeah, do it yourself. Yeah. Well, DIY, that's, what I respect about you. Yeah. that's what I respect about you guys. And I got to tell you, you know, I do what, maybe a dozen conventions a year. And I this may sound like a dickish thing to say. It may sound arrogant. But, you know, I, I pretty much I have to have security walk me down to my table, walk me back up to the room. You know, I, I don't get a fucking moment to myself because, you know, I'm, I'm Brian fucking Keen when I'm there. Except for Bizarro Con. And I love going to... Bizarro Con is this, this annual convention for the Bizarro movement. And it's all these kids. Jeff is like an old man there. Uh, it's weird. You know? I'm like a So, like, if I went, then it would be, like, frightening or something. Well, no, the Skip, John Skip <laughs> oh, and Robert true. Devereaux yeah. are still yeah, there. But yeah, that's true. here's what I love about it. These kids, they don't know who the fuck I am. I've had people ask me, like, yeah. so who's Brian Is, is, he, is like, he, like, a big deal? In <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm there because I love reading bizarre yeah. fiction. Um, and it's nice to go and just be around. I hate to make myself sound old, but to be around young people who have not had all the joy <laughs> raked out of them by this <laughs> business and who are positive and energetic and artistic. And I, I always come away from their writing and re-energized so yay for bizarro and and speaking of bizarro and energetic and making money let's talk about your books let's okay. transition from from jeff burke of deadite press and magazine of bizarro fiction 
and central PA transplant to Jeff Burke, the author. Now, your first novel was Shatner Quake. Yes. Which wins for title of the year right there. Um, the premise, for those of you who haven't read it, is all of William Shatner's screen identities come through from alternate universes. So you've got T.J. Hooker from Fall Guy, and or not Fall Guy, um, T.J. Hooker. Hooker. Yeah. I don't know why the fuck I was thinking Lee Majors and Fall Guy. But and Denny Crane yeah, and Captain yeah, Kirk yeah, Captain and Priceline Shatner. Exactly. And... Um, Shatner Quake was insanely popular. I know for a fact it even caught Rose and Carlton by surprise. And caught all of us from we had yeah. we had no fucking I mean, clue that just, was going to happen. It blew the fuck up. Did that surprise you? It, it totally shocked me. Uh, I, I was I was hoping I would have considered it a huge success if it sold thirty copies. So way more than that, and I never saw it fucking coming. It was actually my first piece of fiction I had ever had published. Yeah. I had given up on trying to be a writer. I've been trying to be a fiction writer for a couple of years and I couldn't get a single thing published. And uh Shannon Quake actually came from a workshop at Bizarro Con. It was at the first Bizarro Con that Carl Tomelik ran what was called the High Concept Workshop. Right. In which the idea was to come up with a a title, a pitch line, and then a back cover summary. What was your pitch line? Do you remember? William Shatner? William Shatner? William Shatner! <laughs> Sold. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's what now, people said. When, I mean, okay. And I, I didn't actually intend for this to be a book. Carlton had actually asked me to be in the workshop because he was worried that not enough people were going to sign up for it. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to pitch to you. He's just like, come up with something that will make me laugh. That's and what that's... Carlton told you. <laughs> But that's not the truth. Carlton, you know, I, I Carlton know, saw something. In you. I never thought about it like that. <laughs> I, I know Carlton. Carlton's one of my dearest, dearest friends. I love him to death. I'm telling you right now. Carlton does just does not say, hey, there's not going to be enough people. Can, can you fill in? No, he saw something in you. Also from that workshop, just a quick note. Cameron Pierce pitched Ask Goblins of Auschwitz. Yes. And Kevin O'Donoghue pitched The Traveling Dildo Salesman. And I know there's a few other books that were pitched in that same workshop that got published, but I'm sorry for the Wasn't life of me. I can't remember what Brandon's they were. Brandon's Rico Slade Will Fucking Kill You? No, I don't. Uh, oh, no, that was, um, uh, sorry, Bradley Sands. Oh, Bradley Sands, yeah. Uh, I'm and I'm honestly God, not sure. That was a bizarre con, but I'm not sure which one that was pitched at. And Bradley, I'm sorry. that I did not mean to fuck up your name. You've been here. You've drank my whiskey, and it was my whiskey that made me fuck up your name just now. So, Okay. Shatner Quest blows the fuck up. Shatner Quick. Or Shatner Quick. Shatner Quest is the uh, and, sort of sequel. And again, that's also the whiskey talk. <laughs> um, now, you you had, had expected it to be this, this small little cult novel. Suddenly, boom, everybody's talking about it. I'm guessing you did not have any sort of likeness contract with William Shatner. Nope. So did you worry about that? Did you get nervous? Oh, my God, I'm going to oh. get sued by, oh, yes. by Shatner. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Rose and I actually had to – we came up with a list of our assets just in case <laughs> if we were subject to a major lawsuit. <laughs> No, what's really fortunate is I realized with my assets, it was like, what are they going to do? Take my cat from me? There you go. Like, I, I, I don't have any assets. <laughs> <laughs> but what, um, though we firmly had prepared, and I still argue this to this day, that we are firmly in legal parody grounds. Well, it's the same I, I, thing yeah, as totally. Mad TV, Saturday Night Live. They do not get permission to do their uh, parodies of pop culture and celebrities and I would and, I would firmly agree and, and my Shatner books are in that same vein you know, and you know Michael Slade Doug Winter both friends of the show both very powerful attorneys I, I think they would agree as well I hope so and, and guys, <laughs> guys you can email us and let us know so you did the sequel Shatner Quest Shatner Quest which is only a sequel in the terms of it's another Shatner book right it's actually completely unrelated to the first one but um, where the first one is about William Shatner having to battle every character he's ever played. Shatner Quest is about uh, the end of the world happens, and the end of the world is everything from 
fantasy, science fiction, and horror media becoming real and running rampant across Earth. Versus and, William Shatner. No, 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 versus yeah. William Shatner. And a Star Trek fan club in Baltimore takes it upon themselves to travel to L.A. to save William Shatner because if they don't, who will? So will you do another one? Will you make it a, an yes. unconnected trilogy? Yes, there will be a third Shatner book. I do not know the name of it yet. Just so I can say, just so I can do the Shatner trilogy, and then I'm never fucking writing about William Shatner ever again. <laughs> I'm going to throw Blake. something out here right now. Feel free to use it. Shatner Shark. <laughs> oh, my God. That's been a running thing. I've listened to every episode of this podcast, and you keep bringing up these fucking sharks. I'm obsessed with sharks. You, what know, you, know, you know what I got him for Christmas last year? A shark? Motherfucking sharks. Oh, motherfucking yeah. sharks, yeah. 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 That was the best thing I read last year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you followed up Shatner Quake with Supergiant Monster Time. Yeah, so it was a Don't Choose Your Own Adventure yeah. book. That was like my tribute to Godzilla movies. Exactly, and that was my question. Now, Carlton has begged me for years to write a choose your own adventure book for a racer head. And I've thought about it and you know, he told me, well, write it down on index cards and, and post it. Well, you need another beer. What oh no, no, sorry. Just burped. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can do that right. In the I was microphone. trying not to, I was trying um, to be polite and you got to call me out. On huh? <laughs> like I said, it's the hard show. Of Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so I forget where I was going with this, but yeah, choose your own adventure book. How, for the writers out there, how the fuck do you plot that out? I mean, how do you do that? What's your that, writing process? That was one of the most insane, mind-numbing things I've ever done in my life. Just the writing and design of it. Um, I, I got this stupid idea in my head that I wanted to be able to say on the cover... Choose from over 50 different endings and shit. And so I decided I was going to do, I, I think it's 53 endings. Because I figured 51 and 52 was a little cheap saying over 50. But 53 is good. And trying to come up with 53 different endings to the same story. <laughs> I that has honestly got been the most difficult writing thing wise I have ever done in my life. Now, in and for the sake of reference, when like those choose your own adventure books from when we were younger had on average fourteen to twenty endings. So wow. I was at more than double what the what the what those old books you remember had. Yeah. So what are you working on now? Uh, right now I am currently working on actually I have three different books in the work. In the works. Um, Have you learned nothing from me? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> Homo bomb, which is about a bomb that's attracted to other bombs when it's supposed to be attracted to people in buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Again, <That'll>, sold. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm ready to read that right now. I'm like, I'm that, putting my pre-order. That I'm will be my that. next book, and I hope, hopefully, it will be out before the end of this year. Um, I'm also working on Lord of the LARPers, which oh is God. which is kind of a uh, a rewrite of Lord of the Flies, except with LARPers battling each other's tribes. So there'll be like a Star Trek LARPing group, a um, Vampire Masquerade LARPing group, um, and a um, a Civil War reenactors with Robert E. Lee. LARPer will be the main villain of the book. For the old white guys on Hard Drive-In who don't know what LARPing <laughs> is, that stands for Live Action Role Play. I didn't even consider the fact there was people who wouldn't know what LARPing is. <laughs> and then I have also started my first straight-up horror novel, which is currently uh, tentatively titled A Snuff Film in a Haunted House. And that's kind of about exactly what that title is. Okay. Cool. I'm, I'm currently working on Suburban Gothic, which is two years overdue, but I promise you that and that book that you and Cameron want from me, you will get both of them before December. Okay. I so. look forward to it. All right. All right. Uh, so you're here for the weekend, and then you are on your way to World Heart Convention in Atlanta. Can, can, folks, can folks find you there? Oh, yeah. I'm... I'll be doing. Uh, I'll be on panels. I'll be behind the table all weekend selling you and, books. You and John Skip are manning the. Yep, uh, it'll table. be myself and Skip are be holding down fort. Well, there you go. And I'm also you. hosting yeah. the. Uh, <laughs> once again, I am hosting the annual gross out contest. Awesome. And I'm really excited awesome. for that. I love hosting the a, gross out a contest. A friend of mine, I saw she posted online today that she's entering that for the first time. Oh, time. awesome! I haven't had the ch a chance to check my email yet to see if I've been getting signups, yeah. but I'm really excited. And where can people find you online? 
one. I mean, they can go to uh, Amazon.com and type in Jeff, J-E-F-F, Burke, B-U-R-K. But where else can they find you? Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I am very active on social media. Just search for Jeff Burke, B-U-R-K, no E on the end. It's yep, not Burke, no e. it's Burke. And um, very active on there. I love interacting with people online, probably a little bit too much. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, awesome. Jeff, I, I just want to say, and I'm going to, this is not the whiskey talking. Um, if I slur, it's, it's because of emotion. I, I'm, first of all, I'm glad to have you on the show and it's awesome that you're going to be here this weekend. We're going to get drunk as fuck as soon as we turn these microphones Hell's off. Hell yeah. But, uh, I, I want to thank you, man. You, you came into my life, not the library, but you know, <laughs> that, that trip to Portland, you, you came into, uh, into my life at a time when, you know, I had hit rock fucking bottom. I had just gone through a divorce. I had just been fucked out of, you know, $38,000, half of my annual income by Dorchester. Uh, I had then declared war on America's oldest mass market publisher, forced them into bankruptcy, and, you know, was castigated by most of our industry for having the audacity to do that. Um, it was a bad time. And then you said, Hey, I like your stuff. And here's why I like your stuff. And, and I would like to be your editor. And I have, uh, I have kind of undergone a career renaissance since then, uh, a second coming, if you will. So I love you. And, uh, I love you too, Brian. You know, like it just fucking amazes you, me that I'm, that I'm like, even here, it's thank also you. from my own perspective, it is just like a totally bizarre to look back and all of these creative people that I loved and respected, now to have the opportunity to be able to say that, not only just that I, I know these people, but that I get to work with them, well, yeah. that my life is based around working, promoting, and spreading awareness of just the stuff that, that I have a passion for, that really just literally keeps me going every single day. If it wasn't for horror, science fiction, fantasy, punk, all of our weird niche subgenres. Yeah. I, I don't know what to, I'd be wasting my fucking life somewhere. Yeah. And the fact that I have this opportunity to be able to do all this, it just constantly blows my mind every single day. You, you are like a son to many of us. And I, I, I'm not putting anybody on the spot, but I know John Skip feels that way. I know Edward Lee feels that way. I know Jesus felt that way. Um, you and, and a young director named Mike Lombardo, you're, you're like everybody's son. And uh, thank you for that, man. Thank you all. All right. I'm going to try not to choke up here. Dave, fill in for me for a second. I just want to say any uh, reality TV show producers out there, if you want to get a, a great show going, take a camera to War Harkon to sit up in front of the booth with him and Skip Orkin. Hey, <laughs> I, I, can't, let it run. I can't say anything much, but I will just say I recently did an audition tape for a reality show, and that's all I can say on the air. Do, do you have to bail real quick? Because I have a really funny anecdote. Go ahead. Okay. Um there was a show called The Amazing Race. You guys remember The Amazing I Race? I want to be on The Amazing, it, it's amazing still on. Race. I, I would still be good on. at that. Yeah. There, there was uh, a very, very big possibility that Wrath, James White, and Maurice Broaddus <laughs> and myself were going were gonna to be on The Amazing Race. <laughs> Um, it did not happen, but it came, it came very close. I had to bow out because at the time my marriage was falling apart and I, I was just like, guys, I, I cannot go off with you for six months on a fucking reality show. I, I got to try to get this shit together. But they actually recorded an audition tape, the two of them. And also Michael Lamo was in the running for Survivor. He made the top 50 picks. Yeah. And, uh, he and I had a deal. You know how Survivor does that, like halfway through the season, they bring in somebody from the mainland. I, I honestly don't know. You, you, you know what I'm about. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like somebody comes in and they're, they're their partner. I was going to be Lamo's partner from uh -huh. the mainland if he got it up. Unfortunately, he didn't get picked. But All right, well, we got to wrap up because Dave is on his way to see Spock's beard, and Jeff and I have a, a lot of stuff to drink when other people get here. But, uh, if there's something you want us to talk about or if there's somebody you want us to talk to or if you just have a question or a comment, you can tweet us at the Horror Show BK. 
or leave a comment on our website at thehorrorshowwithbriankeen.com. The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Android, Roku, and all other platforms via Project iRadio. Visit them online at projectiradio.com. And I do have to mention, Dave, you know, we mentioned there that we're available on Roku via the TuneIn app. We need to do a show where we don't curse the entire time. (laughs) <laughs> I don't yeah. believe you two are capable of that. Well, here, here's why. My seven-year-old... Does it, does it count if you bleep it out? Uh, yeah. We, I, actually, I want to take this challenge. I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I well, want to enjoy why. a challenge. Here's so. why. Last night, uh, I'm, I'm over at my ex-wife's house, and my seven-year-old and I, are, we're playing Minecraft, and we're going at it. And uh, About 6.30, I'm like, all right, buddy, daddy's got to get home. And he's like, oh, why? And I'm like, well, you know... Daddy's show comes on in half an hour. I got I got to be home to promote it, and uh, he knows it's on Roku. You know, he's mm-hmm. seen the the tune in app and he's seen Daddy's picture there. And he says, "Can I listen to it tonight?" And I think back, and it was with Stephen last week's episode. I'm like, "No, you definitely can't listen to it. Why not?" Well, Daddy says some bad words. Well, what kind of bad words? <laughs> um, stupid. And the, answer, the answer should have been all of them. <laughs> because so, yeah, we we need to do a show where neither of us cursed, right, just so I, he can listen to I, his old I, man on the air. I like that. Sometime the next time it's just you and me, because right. I don't put that restriction on a guest. But the next time it's just the two of us. We'll try to do a, a clean show. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right. To advertise in the horror show, contact Jess J E S S at Project I Radio dot com. Thanks again to our sponsor this week, Dark Storm Creative. Visit them online at darkstormcreative.com. Next week, Dave, in studio with us is Damon, Damian Angelica Walters. In fact, I think we're actually doing that from her house, correct? So it won't be in studio. I, I, I suppose. Yes. I suppose. Yeah. Okay. She invited us down for because you know apparently she hasn't listened, and she <laughs> thought it would be a good idea to have us in her home for the day. I can't. Well... <laughs> I'm just speaking for me. I'm amazed if anybody lets me within 50 feet of them. So (laughs) I'm stunned by this. Um, All right. Well, until then, this week's closing in honor of our guest, Jeff Burke. In the words of William Shatner, the good life is one that's artistically made. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll see you next week. Bye.